getting a late start to our program here, but looking around the country, fair weather in the south, but big weather changes coming in from the northwest. First off, let's take a look at the temperature extremes. The hot spot around the world, 114 degrees Fahrenheit at Unadatta in the Australian outback. Yeah, that looks like some desert for sure. Reminds me of an old movie called Wake in Fright from the early 70s. Definitely recommended. And the coldest weather station on the planet, Komaka, Russia, minus 61 Fahrenheit. Well, no Google Street View, so I'm going to have to put it over here off to the east, and you can check that out. That definitely looks like some taiga with a dusty gravel road. Checking in on our teleconnections. Yeah, this has been modified a little bit. We've added the East Pacific Oscillation, and that kind of gives a measure of the flow coming through the Pacific towards the West Coast area. And I've reversed the La Nina and El Nino. This is showing increased momentum across all of the measures. Even the Arctic Oscillation, the annular mode going around the North Pole, that's picking up as well. So we are heading into a more active weather pattern. And the fact that our cold pole has shifted out of the usual areas near Oymikon and Verkoyansk into the central part of Siberia, that does have some implications on the weather coming up towards Christmas. Those cold temperatures tied in with this node of the polar vortex. When we get that going across central Siberia, that's tied in with increased torques in the mountainous areas of Asia. And we don't have to get too much into what that is, but what that usually results in is an increase in elongation of the flow across the Pacific. And as we go into the later time frames, and yes, just a big river of momentum coming across the Pacific towards Christmas. So we're probably going to remain in a high EPO pattern with typical El Nino conditions on the West Coast. That's a good wave right there. Of course, this is pretty far out, but we do see plenty of activity there on the West Coast. So all eyes will be focused on the East Pacific over the coming weeks. Let's take a look at the surface analysis for this evening. We've got cold air flowing through the Dakotas into the Midwest, the Corn Belt, Kansas, and even down into Utah and Nevada. Winter storm warnings in parts of Utah there and snow across parts of North Dakota and northwestern South Dakota. There's how they stack up on the isobars, 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness. Looks like a northern frontal system. This originates from western Canada and the Gulf of Alaska. And then the southern one here originates from a little bit further south off the California coast. In between, Kind of a transitional air mass right there. And then further north, this is the cold air advection flowing back in behind both of them. The cold air advection looks pretty strong in the Four Corners area. Also strong in Kansas, Iowa. And a little bit indeterminate right there in Colorado where a transition has taken place. Here's a quick look at the upper tropospheric chart. 300 millibars, about 30,000 feet. Showing a couple of well-developed ridges troughs, another ridge right there across the East Coast, and a large outgoing weather system in the Atlantic. We can see that the stronger momentum is along the West Coast with a 120-130 knot jet rounding that ridge. This one here will be digging into the Rockies and carving out a deep trough across Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas this weekend. And this is going to show you how things progress. We drop down to 500 millibars, about 18,000 feet. So we can see the jet in between this red and the bluish colors down to the south. So that's going to be the polar front jet. And you're going to see this energy kind of dig in into Texas and Oklahoma as we go forward. So that's going to be midnight, the flow relatively channeled. But we're going to dig out this very sharp trough in Texas going into tomorrow and into Sunday. There it is. This is acting a little bit more like a strong shortwave right there. Sunday morning into Texas and out ahead of it, some pretty good lift. 
and that's going to help deepen a low pressure area that will be tracking up towards the northeastern U.S. and really go to town when it interacts with this warmer water off the Atlantic coast. So that's how things go through the rest of the weekend. Strong short wave, late Sunday night moving through the Carolinas and then up into the northeastern U.S. Here's how it looks on the surface chart. Start out with that front, as we mentioned, coming out of the Great Plains and the Southern Rockies. And then by tomorrow, the cold front really takes shape out there in the lower Mississippi River Valley. We have a slight risk from SPC for severe weather from the Shreveport area up to Little Rock, Memphis, over to Nashville and down towards Jackson. There could be a few supercells in that area and that's associated with a southerly flow coming into that region. Strong cold air advection in the wake of this low, and then later during the weekend, there's that low pressure area moving northeastward, gathering strength, and then as it approaches the coast, we get this deep low. I'm not going to call that the storm of the century or anything, but definitely looking at 998, 999 millibars, and very strong southerly flow. Those arrows really start packing in and coming together. So we're looking at maybe 30 to 40 miles an hour, maybe gusts up to 60 miles an hour, anywhere from New York City, Delaware, all the way up towards Maine. And we do have winter storm warnings and advisories in parts of northern New England and advisories in Canada, basically from Montreal and Cornwall, all the way up the St. Lawrence. And then the last frame is that exits moving very quickly, so the impacts will not be hanging around for very long, and that cold air infection sweeps into the area by Monday afternoon. And let's just take you very quickly through the rest of the week. Another shot of cold air advection, mostly into the northeastern U.S., remaining mild down south. Although we do get some isentropic lift developing in Texas around midweek, maybe some wintry weather in New Mexico, and just kind of cloudy and unsettled through much of the southern U.S., and then another round of cold air filtering down for the following weekend. So let's come back to the weather this evening. There's our fronts once again, warm front through the Great Lakes area, cold front down south, and then another system down in northeast Texas. Let's do our cross-section and work our way westward. Okay, the cross-sections. I've done something a little bit different here. See those red lines, very thin red lines? Those are isotherms. Now, typically, we do not add these to cross sections because the potential temperature, the isentropes, the black lines, those give us more information. But from an introductory level, I think the isotherms are kind of useful, even around frontal boundaries, especially around frontal boundaries. So what do we see here? Across the Atlantic, We've got cold air spilling out across the ocean, so we're getting very cold air being heated from below, and we get those steep lapse rates right there. You can see the packing of the red lines indicating a temperature gradient in the lowest 5,000 feet or so. So that's some very shallow, unstable air, and as a result, the isentropes, they tend to go vertical because that's where air mass modification has taken place. Aloft, though, a little bit more packing of those red lines. That indicates a return to more of a stable profile. Anyway, let's start heading west. You can see things evolve as we go on to the east coast. We finally see some changes as we go towards the Rockies. And we pick up this little frontal boundary right there. Notice how we get the packing of the isentropes right there. And we also see the isotherms, they kind of take this dip, kind of like that, or this uh, kind of a stair-step appearance. I think that really helps bring out the frontal boundaries. Now, that is a transition zone. The frontal boundary is up on the warm side, which is up on top. And another little frontal boundary right there. So kind of a, kind of a dual-layer structure. And that's going to be up over Kansas and Oklahoma, and that's on the back side of that Canadian system that we talked about. There's that other boundary in Texas does not show up so well, very subtle. And that's going to be in this area. But we see a lot of blue indicating moist air from the Gulf. OK, 
Okay, we head out west a little bit further. You can see things evolve. There's another frontal boundary right there. In fact, that's probably the same one there over the Texas Panhandle right there. And another segment up top. So we can probably put that together, and that's probably our front. And there's the polar front jet sitting right up above it and maybe coupled with a subtropical jet. Okay, we go into the Rockies. You're going to see the mountains pop up here. There they go. And we see that front in the southern part of the Rockies, New Mexico, Colorado, jet sitting up on top. And this is all the cold air mass. Let's go a little bit further. Can still pick up that front right there. That touches ground about uh, near Flagstaff. And we head further out west. The front is still in place and looks like that touches ground near Los Angeles, maybe San Diego, kind of in that area there. So a lot to see here on these cross sections. There's the San Joaquin Valley, an inversion helping to trap some of that fog and haze. And here we have the marine layer off the California coast. And we'll take a look at those east-west cross sections, starting out with Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico right there. There's all that moisture. As we head north, we start to cross into some of those weather systems on the plains, kind of in this area here. We don't see the fronts all that well because we're kind of parallel to them instead of crossing them. But I do see an air mass contrast right there. That's going to be in this north to south area between Nevada and California. So that's probably the western periphery of that cold northwestern U.S. air mass. Heading up north a little bit further, there's a big dome of cold air across Idaho and Wyoming. Jet coming toward us on the west side and then maybe flowing away from us on the other side because we got that trough right there in between. And we head further north. There's how things evolve. Can't really tell too much, and then we lose the data. It's almost like the curtains going away. All right. So maybe you understand this chart a little bit better now. We saw that big dome of cold air across Idaho and Wyoming, Montana. That definitely showed up on the cross sections, and that kind of showed where the center of the coldest air was. And then we saw that tropical air along the Gulf Coast flowing up into Missouri and Arkansas. So here's a closer look at that weather, looking at the current surface chart. We can see that Canadian front right there. Notice how it contrasts with westerly downslope flow through Tucumcari, Lubbock, just south of Amarillo. And then north of that, we've got the Canadian air mass flowing south. And as we move up into Colorado, we pick up a winter storm warning north of Colorado Springs. We're looking for some significant snow in that area, possibly up to 10 inches, that will affect part of Interstate 25. Snow showers, rain showers a little bit further to the east, and the mountains getting some snow showers as well. And there's that wintry weather in the Salt Lake City area. Winter storm warnings affecting mostly above 5,000 feet. And then looking around Nevada, yeah, this is a cold air mass. Temperatures near freezing and significantly below freezing in central Nevada. And we've got northeasterly flow into Vegas. Typically, the flow is southwesterly to southerly in Vegas. So when you see those northeasterly winds in Vegas, that tells you that a front has already passed. And we will be setting up those Santa Ana wind conditions in the Los Angeles area for tomorrow. If you look at the pressures, 1030, 1029 millibars up there near Winnemucca versus 1018 further south. Now, that's only about 10 to 12 millibars of difference. But when you start getting up towards 15 and 16, that becomes significant for Santa Ana's. And there they are coming together. This is tomorrow morning. We've got Let's see, that looks like 1036 in Winnemucca versus 1016. So that's 20 millibars. That's all we need for Santa Ana winds. You can see the pressure gradient between those two areas. So we got high wind warnings for late tonight into tomorrow for much of the San Fernando Valley, 
the surrounding mountains for 35 miles an hour gusts to 70 for tomorrow. Wind advisories, fire weather watch as far south as Glendale and Altadena, which is north of Los Angeles. Red flag warnings across the Inland Empire, Ontario, Riverside, Corona, Murrieta, that area expecting gusts up to 50. And those wind advisories stretch all the way up the coastal range. And we can see how that plays out through the remainder of the weekend. Big 10 40 millibar high across Salt Lake City. You can see that pressures are starting to go down in Winnemucca as that high tracks southeast. That'll allow the Santa Ana wind conditions to relax a bit. And as we get into later on Sunday, 1026 versus 1020, that's only about 6 to 8 millibars, and that will tend to shut the winds down. And then taking a quick look up in Alaska, because our weather this time of year does tend to come from there. We do have cold conditions in the interior, down to minus 13 at Fort Yukon. Looking pretty good, but we do have high wind warnings around Ketchikan to Prince of Wales Island for Saturday, expecting southeast winds up to 60 miles an hour for gusts, and there are gale warnings along the coast there. Winter storm warning tonight and early Saturday in this area right here. That's going to be associated with this occluded low. And then heading into the Canadian high Arctic, the dew line area, distant early warning. That's that chain of radar stations from the Cold War that ran about like that. And as a result, we have a lot of weather stations, a lot of airfields, and quite a few communities along that belt right in that area. The northern Canadian high Arctic looks a little bit mild. We could be seeing minus 20s, minus 30s this time of year, but we're only seeing about zero to minus 18. And that's due to some of that warm air which has flowed northward and around counterclockwise around this Hudson Bay low. And then dropping into Canada, cool conditions, weather system moving into Ontario. We do have snowfall warnings in parts of Canada around, uh, let's see here, Deer Lake and Sandy Lake, expecting 6 to 10 inches of snow. And then heading out into Quebec, no problems there, but they are looking for a piece of that weather system in the northeastern U.S. to affect that area later on Sunday going into Monday. Here's a look at the GFS precipitation totals, about 2 to 3 inches from North Carolina up to Maine, and another atmospheric river coming into Washington and Oregon. That's also producing widespread 1 to 3 inch amounts. And let's take a look at the snowfall. Corridor of snow from Burlington, northern New Hampshire, up to Caribou. That looks to be about 6 to 12 inches. And around midweek, we're going to see maybe a bit of a weather system in the panhandles. And northeastern New Mexico could be 10 to 15 inches in that area. All right, time to close this up. I know some of you are probably wondering where the program is. So why don't we get it posted? I want to thank our newest Patreon supporters, Rahan Osterk and Eric Johnson. Thank you very much for your support. And as for everybody else, if you're a supporter, thank you very much. If you're not a supporter, please consider that if you want to see more of these excellent graphics and these educational weather breakdowns. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday for the private supporter video. All of our Patreon supporters, of course, get access to that. And for everybody else, we'll see you back here on Wednesday. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.